Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the managing director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are the digital interview series that we launched with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, the next of which we're hosting September 12th to the 14th here in New York City at the Javits Center Expansion. But our goal at those events and our goal on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. We are very excited today to welcome Carrie Healy to SALT Talks. Uh, Carrie has a, a fantastic resume with a career that spans higher education, elected office, and foreign and domestic policy. In July of 2019, she capped six years as the first female president of Babson College, which is the 100-year-old business school consistently ranked as the country's leading institution in entrepreneurship education. During her tenure at Babson, Healy championed women entrepreneurs, created greater affordability and access for students, and oversaw a dramatic $200 million renewal of the Wellesley campus. Previously, Healy served as the Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor, where she led bipartisan efforts to improve services for the homeless, tackle the opioid crisis, and increase protections for victims of child abuse, drunk driving accidents, and sexual and domestic violence. She was also an integral part in crafting the state's pioneering healthcare reform legislation. Healy has been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government's Institute for Politics and Center for Public Leadership, and is on the International Council of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She holds an AB in government from Harvard College and a PhD in political science and law from Trinity College in Dublin. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a trustee of the American University of Afghanistan. Hosting today's SALT Talk is a familiar face if you watch this show. It's Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to him to begin the interview. Gary, thank you so much for uh, joining us and congratulations on your amazing career. Um, let's talk about MCAAD, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, but it's really the uh, American dream. I had the opportunity last summer to be interviewed for it, which I found to be fascinating. It was actually, uh, I humbly accepted it. I don't know if I'm, quote unquote, the American dream, but it felt great to talk about my grandparents. But tell us about your background and how it's prepared you for this moment in your career. Well, well, first of all, thank you, Anthony, for having me on today to, to discuss this. It's a really exciting project. So I'm, I'm currently the president of the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. Uh, it's both a physical location in, in right on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, across from the Treasury and the White House, in these beautiful old bank buildings, the old uh, Bank of America building and, and the Riggs Bank building. But, but it's also an idea and an, and an online presence that's already up and running. We haven't opened our physical doors yet. But so we're going to be talking today uh, a little bit about what, we, what we're going to be doing and what we are doing online first. So when I first heard about this project, you asked me how my, my background led me to this, uh, to this project. Um, you know, I have to start way back earlier. I mean, my, like you were just saying, my my mom was a first generation American. My my grandmother was an immigrant from Germany who showed up at nine years old with four dollars at Ellis Island. So you know the the notion of the American dream and those promises around where education could lead you, where hard work could lead you, was just an intrinsic part of my entire upbringing. And I was lucky enough so that it worked for me. You know, I was able to go to a good college. I was able to pursue a good career. And when I started into the workforce, the first place I went was a think tank called Apt Associates in Cambridge. And I worked on research projects for the U.S. Department of Justice, looking at crime issues. And it was there that I first really saw how deeply many people don't get to experience the American dream. And, you know, I saw the people who were falling through the cracks, whether they were victims of domestic violence or whether they were people who hadn't been able to complete college or whether they were drug addicted or whether they'd been, you know, just simply mired in poverty their entire life and they weren't able to get out. 
And so that actually eventually led me to get involved with politics, because after 10 years of doing research on all the things that were going wrong in our society, even, you know, in the 80s and 90s, which sometimes people now look back on and say, oh, things were better then, there was a lot to be fixed, you know, throughout throughout our history. And, and so I went into politics in the late 1990s thinking at least I can shine a light on some of the things that I'm seeing that, that society can and should fix. And so that's really what led me to get into, uh, into politics. I ran unsuccessfully a couple of times, ended up as lieutenant governor in Massachusetts with Mitt Romney in the mid 2000s. And I really had an opportunity at that point to start thinking about, you know, how can we address homelessness? How can we address domestic violence? How can we start to put people back on that path to achieving their dreams if they fell, you know, fell to the wayside or never had the opportunity to do that in the first place? And, and I got a, you know, a great exposure during those years to um, the importance of entrepreneurship, the importance of job creation by small businesses. And so when I moved out of that, uh, that time in my life and started looking for what to do next, I was really drawn to an opportunity at Babson College where I served as president for six years because they were all about entrepreneurship. They were all about creating and, and, and preparing young people to pursue their dreams in any direction they could and to be very successful at it, to be methodical about it and to learn that art of thinking like an entrepreneur. And so when I was looking at my next step after that, and I heard about this project that the Milken Institute was starting, uh, which was really focused on how do you increase prosperity and opportunity for people in America? How do you restore hope in that promise of the American dream, which I never doubted, but many people do and legitimately so at this point? Um, I was really excited, and I wanted to be a part of that. You, you, you know, it's it's an amazing. You've had an amazing career, and you've done a great amount for education and for the state of uh, Massachusetts. But also, you and Governor Romney, I think, developed a way of doing things uh, that other states adopted as well, including you know the healthcare issue, of course, which we both know about. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a flat out, straight up question. Is the American dream dead for a large amount of people? And if it isn't dead, um, what are we doing wrong? Because there's a large group of people in the country that think it is dead. And so I'm worried about it. I'm, I'm interested to get your reaction, given your yeah. life experience and vantage point. Yeah. So when I open my doors, when we open our doors on Pennsylvania Avenue, I believe that there are two types of people who are going to walk in the door. There are going to be people who walk in the door who, like you and, and me, have genuinely experienced the American dream. And our lived experience is going to tell us that it's not dead because we're, we're living embodiments of it. We've had those opportunities. Yes, we had to work hard. Yes, we had to fight hard. But we found we threaded that, that needle and we got through and, and, and we were able to achieve what we wanted to achieve, at least a lot of it. Um, but there's going to be another whole group of people who walk in the door and they're going to say that dream was never for me. It was never including of me or maybe my obstacles are too high or maybe they feel that America has changed and that those traditional pathways to to the American dream are closed, not only to them, but to many, many people. And, and if you do polling around the American dream right now, most people are more optimistic for themselves than they are for others which I think is a really interesting uh, point because it, it means that they're hearing all of these obstacles. They're more aware of obstacles for other people and they're quite empathetic and they're worried. But that's also why a lot of people these days say maybe the American dream is dead. So what we're trying to do is to assess the situation, assess the playing field very with clear eyes, you know, not, not to try to engage in any, any kind of spin around what's possible for people and what isn't possible. But, but rather to say, okay, here are the set of obstacles that exist today to the American dream. And what can we do to remove them? You know, who can we engage in that effort? Because it's a worthy effort. It's not, what is our country if it doesn't have hope? And what, you know, what is a person's life if they don't have hope that they can create something and achieve their dreams? So I think it's a very existential question for America. How do you make sure that the American dream is alive? And we should never accept it when people say that it's dead. We should fight against that and try to figure out how we can make sure that people believe in it. So 
correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I've, I've known uh, Michael Milken for 25 years. I've had the re- relationship with Mitt Romney for two decades. Uh, we're about equal opportunity, but unequal outcomes. Is that fair to say? And so if that is fair to say, how do we create a platform for people of equal opportunity, uh, Lieutenant Governor? Yeah. So I, I also think it's not not just about equal opportunity. It's it's also about equal opportunity, not at a, not only at a starting point, but throughout one's, you know, one's career. So, you know, yes, getting into school and getting I think getting a good education, a good public education is the first step right toward creating that that even playing field and then having different pathways that you can travel to achieving your dreams that are affordable, that are accessible, that are not discriminatory, that's the next step. And then once you get there, the question is, do you have access to capital? If you have like great dreams, but nobody's going to finance you, you know, then it's not a a level playing field again. And so when you're, for example, uh, a woman or someone of color, and you're going in front of a venture capitalist to be funded, you know, you have less than a 4% chance of getting funding because for whatever reason, venture capital has just not been given to, to people of color and women in the past. And so, so there's a whole bunch of different junctures at which we have to make sure that that playing field is level. And I don't think we can ever just sort of stop and say, hey, everybody gets a free public education, you know, or, or, or there's a lot of good colleges. I'm sure you should just go get an education and everything would be fine. We have to really look at those institutional and social obstacles that, that persist throughout life. And, the, and that sort of chip away at that notion of equal opportunity. One of the, one of the things about your career, my observation at least, is uh, you've been a champion for uh, closing the income gap, uh, mm-hmm. raising middle-class living standards, uh, uh, creating a more burgeoning wider birth for the middle-class. Uh, and when I look at some of the statistics now, it seems like there's a wealth gap spreading again. Am I right about that, or am I wrong about that? And can you talk about some, can you talk Absolutely. about some of the things you did in Massachusetts to sort of tighten that gap, if you will, or create a, a wider berth of the middle class? Yeah. So, so I'm really fascinated as an observer of politics these days because I'm 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 now at a nonpartisan organization, so I'm an observer. But as an observer of politics, I'm actually surprised that neither party has fully grasped the degree to which the the middle class has been hollowed out over the course of the last thirty years, and that this itself is a huge danger to America. And a lot of what's been driving this hollowing out has been uh, the, the simultaneous growth in our, our equities. I know right now everyone is looking at the stock market and seeing it crash, but for you know more than 20 years, it was on an upward tra- trajectory. And so those who own stocks, owns who, in an ownership culture, those who were invested in the equities markets did very, very well. And by and large, 50% of, of the poorest Americans weren't invested at all. And, and so it, it's created this situation where, where a small por- a portion of Americans have really has seen their wealth grow over the last 30 years. And, and, and unfortunately, the poor have actually in real dollars gotten poorer. And so, and, and, and in the meantime, the middle has, has somewhat disappeared. And, and so we really have to address that. And you know, the, the programs that I'm looking at now that I think I think the the I think actually the solutions that we have to look at or ones we have to look at now um, have to do with either emulating uh, the superannuation system that exists in Australia, which has been so successful in making sure um, that Australians actually uh, the average Australian is wealthier than the average American as a result of this retirement system and this this equity ownership system that they have. Uh, we have to look at that and say how could that be replicated in the U.S. Um, we also have to look at how uh, 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 pr- uh, private equity companies have been distributing equity when they when they buy companies. And there's a huge movement right now uh, among a number of private equity companies to look at the advantages of giving even the the, the frontline employees uh, equity in in the companies in which they're invested because it helps with 
uh, employee retention. It helps with productivity. And those companies become more profitable when equity and ownership is, is spread more evenly across organizations. And so we as a society need to start thinking deeply about how do we become an ownership culture? How do, how do we become a place where everyone participates in the prosperity of the country as a whole? Because where I think we've been falling down is that there can be, the, the as, as people have been observing, the, the wealth in Wall Street going well, but the wealth on Main Street not going well. And, and we have to make sure that we have um, economic and also political uh, constructs that allow everyone to benefit at once. You, you, you have a, a podcast, uh, Start Small, Dream Big, um, where you're interviewing small business owners, uh, which I think is fabulous. And obviously, you and I both know that small businesses drive employment, small businesses drive some levels of innovation. And obviously, there's a ton of uh, small business entrepreneurs in our society. Uh, why are small businesses such an area of focus for you? and for the Milken Foundation and what you guys are doing related to the American yeah. dream. Yeah, I, I fell in love with small businesses when I was running for office. I think you you know that one of the things you do is you go town to town. And I was, I was in charge of being liaison to all the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. And so I would visit all of them and I would get to meet the, the local entrepreneurs. And I think often people think of entrepreneurs as, you know, Bill Gates or Elon Musk or something unattainable and large. But in truth, all companies start small and and many of them really just want to be part of that community ecosystem. And again, if I could put my finger on something that America needs more of today, it's that social cohesion on a community level, that caring about your neighbors and knowing your neighbors um, that, again, we've, we have lost to some degree uh, over the course of the last 30 years. And so uh, I started this podcast, Start Small, Dream Big. I hope people will go on our, our website, uh, mcaad.org, and, and look at the uh, the, the uh, podcast. But they're wonderful stories, and they're, they're stories from across the country and of entrepreneurs of every background and every, uh, every interest. Uh, one of my favorite ones is literally of a woman who decided to uh, recycle mannequins and, and sell them online. And at one point her entire backyard was filled with mannequin heads and arms and torsos. <laughs> and so you can, you can be an entrepreneur and do almost anything. And I used to think when I was in office that it was foolish that we spent so much time chasing these large companies, trying to get them to bring a hundred or 500 or even a thousand you know, jobs to the state. We'd feel that that was so amazing when 99% of all the businesses in the country are small businesses. And if they could just be growth mindset focused enough to add one job, then, then our economy would explode. So, so I think the focus on small business is very merited. And uh, you know, we, we think about large business enough. We need to really think about how do we support our small businesses? And so many of them suffered uh, during COVID and, and yet they've been resilient. They were the, really the ones who dug in and helped their community and helped their neighbors and often pivoted to provide some critical service that was needed at that time. So I just have endless admiration for small businesses and small business people, and I'll never get tired of talking to them. And, you know, and I, and I, love, and I admire that about you, which is why I wanted to bring it up. But, but I, I want to ask you this question. I don't want to make this political because you, you said that you were a political observer. And I was thinking to myself, well, I'm a banged up and bruised political observer. At least, you know, your political career was like infinitely longer than mine. Let's just put it that way. But what are some things in a bipartisan way, Carrie, that we could do. So I'm not looking for positions in tribal politics, but just not yeah. left or right. What are some right or wrong things that you think we could get a general agreement on from most Republicans and most Democrats to improve the middle class and to mm -hmm. enhance the American dream? Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, I'll tell you two things that I feel very strongly about, and I, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'll start with this one. We need to figure out how to scale national service in America. We talk about national service all the time. <clears throat> we have some wonderful programs, Teach for America and, and AmeriCorps and others. They, they only engage maybe a couple hundred thousand people. 
And, and there are more than 2 million people leaving uh, high school every year who don't go to college. And so what are we doing? Like, why haven't we figured out how to make sure that there's a unifying experience for all Americans where we serve, where we, we serve, which is elevating. We know that we can actually make people feel better about themselves and about others and to learn more about other people and other geographies if we can just get them out to serve for a year in a place maybe that's unusual to them, maybe with people who they wouldn't have met in the normal course of their life, it's going to be life-changing. And I bet you, and, and I know I have done years abroad or years working in, in places where we didn't expect to work, and it changes you. It changes your perspective, and, and it makes you more empathetic, and it, and it gives you a greater sense of um, what this country can and should be. So, so if I would say there was one thing that I think of both people on the left and the right should come together around right now, it should be amplifying programs like the ones that are under, being undertaken right now in California, where they're creating cores of youth who can earn college credits and earn scholarships toward college by volunteering for a year after high school. I think that we need to begin to link some of these things together, some of the social benefits that I think we all need, like a more affordable college education, to actually investing in the in the country. And they've started a climate core and they've started all different types of service opportunities, ones around healthcare, ones around education. Um, there's a lot of needs out there. I'm not worried about that. But we need to figure out how do we do the infrastructure? And maybe it needs to be done state by state, but we have to do that. We have to create a unified narrative for the youth of America in order to, to come together again. So that, that's number one. And, and number two is related to that, which is that we have to figure out how to make the pathways to education uh, broader and flatter so, so that people can feel just as good about leaving high school and doing a certificate that gets them into a technical job uh, that is a good paying technical job, which may pay just as much as a job you would get coming out of a four-year college education as they would about, you know, trying to go to that community college or, or four-year college that might financially be out of their reach. And so we have to start getting companies. And again, this could be a bipartisan effort. Get companies to recognize the fact that some 70% of all the jobs out there that require a college education don't actually require a college education. You could have skills training that would be maybe six weeks or six months that, that would allow you to do that job perfectly well. And so as soon as companies start taking off those requirements for extra credentials that are really not relevant to the job, then I think opportunity in America is going to be much more open and, and flatter, you know, so, so, that, so that it isn't this um, golden ticket that you have to buy this four-year education, this it, the, in order to get into this club of people who can actually make a decent living. So I think those are two bipartisan issues I would I would love to see um, our our politicians address at this time, and 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 they're going to be ones that we're going to be talking about at the uh, Center for Advancing the American Dream. Well, I I certainly agree with you, and I you know I have uh, a dad that served in the U.S. Army, and two uncles, um, older uncles are now deceased that were in World War II all of which felt that their service in the army glued them closer to the country. And, you know, of course, you could see people like Bob Dole and George McGovern on opposite sides of the aisle, but they had respect for each other because they had both served in World War II. I'm just wondering if some of that glue has come out of the system, that's that national service that you're speaking of. Um, talk about Michael Milken for a second, because, uh, you know, I guess I guess I have a man crush on Michael Milken. I'll admit that. I think he's a brilliant innovator. Tell us about your relationship with Michael. Yeah. So so he's our founder. And and Mike has, since his earliest time at Berkeley, been really concerned about how do you make prosperity more uh, broadly available? He wrote a, a prosperity formula. He's a mathematician. I think I don't have to tell you that he's a, he's a brilliant mathematician and in addition to uh, being brilliant in finance. And and so he he wanted to think about it in 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 financial terms or in or in mathematical terms. And so he wrote a prosperity formula, you know, thinking that 
you know, if you had financial technologies that that could be a multiplier, you know, for human capital and and real assets and and all of these other pieces of of wealth in the country that that you could do better. And so, you know, what I what I have really admired about him is that he has spent his life uh, trying to create new financial technologies that open up access to capital uh, for people who would never have had it before. I'm you know I'm thinking about. Uh, Reggie Lewis being one of the the first you know truly successful black entrepreneurs you know funded by by Michael Milken and and his his visionary investments in some of the transformations of telecommunications in the 90s so so I think that it's it's great to be around someone who is always thinking about the next era you know even even beyond where he will be with us he's still thinking about where is the world heading and he has those conversations constantly so it's great to uh it's great to be part of you know with him and and part of the milken institute that has embraced that ethic well i think you know i think it's i think it's very well said so let's talk about walking into this beautiful complex that you guys are creating uh, what's the experiential thing that will happen to somebody that steps off of Pennsylvania Avenue and walks into this beautiful center? Yeah, well, it will be a melding of both high technology and sort of cutting edge technology and these beautiful historic structures. So we're both celebrating history, but we want people to know that we're talking about the future, that we're thinking about their future. And when they when they walk into these bank halls, uh, the first thing they're going to be asked to do is to really think about what is the definition of the American dream and to confront you know, that question for themselves. They'll be provided with a bunch of examples of what other people have thought it is. And it's a very broad set of, of definitions that, that we will, will provide. But we're hoping to get someone thinking and, and, and starting to, to go, do, that, do that work themselves. Um, we'll be talking about the importance of multi-generational uh, progress toward the American dream. And we're going to have another hallway that, that, that looks at the family tree and, and tries to get people to think about their families and their origins and how family contributes and community uh, contributes to, to the American dream. And then we'll dig down a little bit into our, our four pillars, which are education, health, finance, and entrepreneurship. So, Carrie, let's talk about your family for a second. Tell us about the uh, the story of your family, uh, how they came to America, uh, how they got started here, what were they doing, yeah, uh, and how you how you, how it shaped your life and the the dreams and the realities that you've created. Well, I'm a second generation American, as I mentioned. My my grandmother uh, was was. Uh, coming from Germany, uh, her family had offended the Kaiser and they were fleeing uh, political oppression at that time and uh, arrived in Ellis Island, uh, basically no money, few dollars to their name, uh, ended up, uh, my grandmother ended up being a hat maker and, and a seamstress, a very talented one. Uh, she she met uh, my, my grandfather, who was an architect from Canada, and they ended up in the uh, in in the very bottom part of Florida, in on a swamp, uh, in outside of Tampa, being citrus farmers during during the Great Depression. And so, I don't think any any of them could have imagined that they would have gone from building buildings to uh, to and, and making hats to being subsistence farmers in in Florida. But that's what economics does, you know, to people. And so, they were very proud to be able to send my mother. At age 16 to college, she was the first woman in my my family to uh, to go to college. She went to Florida State, and she became a, a elementary school teacher. She became a, a public elementary school teacher. My dad fought in World War II, uh, and uh, was stayed in the army for many years. He stayed in the army reserves for 27 years after that. And I had just a wonderful upbringing with them in Florida, and they were strong role models for me in terms of the values that. Uh, I hope I carry with me and I carry with me to this job, which was a, a dedication to public service. My mom viewed teaching as a public service and teaching is a huge part of what we're talking about at the center. It's it's one fourth of our pillars. And um, as you probably know, the, the Milken Family Foundation has been giving out 
uh, educator awards uh, in, in every state in the, in the country for the last 38 years. And so we have this reservoir of some you know, 2,000 master teachers who we're drawing on to help us create curriculum uh, for, our, for our center. So I think uh, teaching and learning were important parts of, of my upbringing, as was service. You mentioned the word service. That was your last word. I want to talk about that because some light went off in your head at some point where you said, OK, I'm having this great career but I now want to go into politics. And you and I both know politics is rough and tumble, and it looks a lot more glamorous from the outside than when you get in there and you have to start slugging it out. So what was the light bulb moment? What was the eureka moment for you to transition into public service? Yeah, I I think I actually already referenced it, which was my 10 years of writing white papers and doing research for for the US uh, Department of Justice. And I don't in any way regret that time because it gave me a deep understanding of public policy, which I was able to bring with me into government. But the thing that it taught me was that if you don't have power, you can know the answer to something. I I bet there are thousands of people out there listening to this right now who know the answers to some critical question facing the country, but they don't have an avenue to either convince people to, to make that change or to even communicate that. And so I had been writing papers and going to conferences and writing little articles about, you know, child abuse and neglect and domestic violence and drug crime and gang violence. And nobody was reading it. Nobody was reading it at all. It was just totally ineffectual. So I thought, okay, well, if I run for office, I'll have a I'll have a platform. And even if I lose and I expected to lose because I was a Republican in a state where Republicans made up 13% of the voting public. So the likelihood that I would win would just be a, you know, a, a, a miracle of some variety. So I, I really did it just to be able to talk about the things I was passionate about and at least get those issues on the table for discussion. And you know, politics is a great forum for doing that. And you know, holding your holding your elected officials accountable for the issues that you care about, that that really works. And so after a couple of years, um, I realized I was I was just losing endlessly. Uh, and I ended up uh, running for chairman of the Republican Party in Massachusetts and was elected and was able to recruit Mitt Romney to come back uh, and run for governor. And I joined him. And that, and that gave me the first opportunity I'd had to actually implement uh, some of the policies that I'd been working on for the last you know, 10 years. And it's, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to move quickly and know what your agenda is. I think the worst feeling in the world would be to have run for office without knowing what you wanted to accomplish and then get elected and then have to try to figure it out. That's when you find out that politicians can be influenced by special interests or by lobbyists or others when they don't genuinely have an agenda of their own. And we always knew what we were there to do. Will you, will you go back? Will you go back? Will you run again? Oh, oh gosh. I was wondering where I was going back to. Um, you know, you know, I I won't ever say never because I think that that's, that's a bad thing to do. Um, but I want to always be where I can be most effective. And so, you know, at that time in my 40s, the most effective place for me was in, in uh, public office and in, and in running for office. Um, I'm not sure that that's now my most effective place to be but I'll always be working on these issues. So I, I hope that I will find ways to continue to, to have impact no matter where I am. What would you say to the American people right now about our current political dynamic? And, and what hope would you offer to them based on your historical understanding of America in terms of where we can go as Americans from where we are today? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that people of my generation, anyway, always imagined that progress was linear and it was always forward moving. And some of us have had the the disconcerting sense that we were back in the 70s recently. <laughs> and, you know, and in, in, in all the ways you can imagine, it is, you know, there are so many parallels to, to the kinds of concerns that the country was confronting during the 1970s at, at moment at this moment. And I hope that this is going to make us more sober 
and and serious about our political participation. And I hope it makes us love our democracy and understand that we need to protect that and and to work for the transparency that's going to rebuild the trust that everyone has to have in public institutions. It makes me really sad when I see that Americans have lost faith in so many of our institutions. And so that that institutional rebuilding uh, of trust is has to be one of our, our top priorities. So that, that I, I do believe it can be done. And I also think there's no alternative to optimism. What what are you going to do if you're not an optimist? You have to you have to hope for a better future, but more than hope, you have to actually contribute to building it. Well, I have, I have to tell you, I'm a big admirer of yours. Uh, I've listened to you speak at these Romney events. I've watched your interviews. Uh, I followed your political career, uh, and I have a, I have an enormous amount of confidence in the project that you're doing, and it gives me hope for the American dream. Um, I just have one last question, um, and it's a it's a hypothetical. People don't like answering hypotheticals, okay? But I wanna I wanna give you this hypothetical. You are the president of the United States, and there are <laughs> well, two, that's a pretty big hypothetical. So I don't think two, anyone's going to imagine that that could actually be real. But go well, ahead. you yes. just never know in life, yeah, okay? You just never know in your yeah. career and how talented you are. But you are the president of the United States. <laughs> What are one or two initiatives that you would want to do day one or immediately in the first hundred days uh, to help improve the American dream? Mm. Yeah, I, I think I think healthcare is going to be one of the most important things. Right, right now, if you look at who's going bankrupt, 60% of Americans who go bankrupt go go bankrupt because of healthcare costs. So we have a lot of unfinished business uh, in that regard. And it's something that Americans haven't traditionally thought of as a human right, the ability to have health care, but it really is. And we need to move forward and start thinking about how do we make that service, but but honestly, that that thing that people people deserve to have, the, the confidence that if they become ill, they can get the best possible care. Uh, and and that their life is as valuable as the next person's life. I think that's such a fundamental thing to to begin to address. And we need to be honest about it. It's you know it can be done in a um, you know in in a free market manner. We did that in Massachusetts. We didn't cut the the private insurance companies out of the process. Um, but but what we did do is we made sure that everyone had coverage. And and we we need to work consistently toward making sure that technology is used to, to bring down the cost of healthcare for everyone. So I think I would begin to start working on these quirks in the system that, that distort the system and make it so that it doesn't work for the average person, whether that's an entrepreneur or whether it's someone seeking healthcare um, or if it's someone looking for an education that's effective and is going to get them a good job. Well, this has been incredible for me. Uh, Kerry Healy, thank you so much for joining Salt Talks. I uh, look forward to seeing you at the Milken Conference, the Salt Conference, and other places. And uh, um, I, I can't wait for this center to open. I don't get to Washington much because of my allergy to Washington after the fiasco I lived with, but I promise to go and visit the center when it opens. And, and Anthony, can I ask your, your listeners to do one thing for me, which is Please. that if they're thinking about changing jobs, if they're thinking about going into a tech-related field and looking for a, jo a, a job that's going to pay them up to 70% more than, than what they're making now, uh, we actually have a free scholarship program. We have 200,000 scholarships that we are making available online right now through theamericandreamacademy.org. Or, or you can go to our, our website, which is mcaad.org, and learn about these scholarships. They're transforming so many people's lives right now. We have 23,000 people signed up right now who are participating in these uh, free scholarships to do uh, work with Google or Meta or IBM or Salesforce. And, and hopefully, these credentials will get these individuals much better and higher paying jobs. I love it. Very well said. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. So much. It's really, really terrific to have you on. Thank you again to Carrie Healy for joining us on today's Salt Talk. 
And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes of Salt Talks, you can access them on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks, on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube, or anywhere that you consume podcasts. You can also listen to Salt Talks in audio form. Just a reminder, we're on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks, the work that Carrie has done uh, in higher education now that she's doing at the Center for the American Dream. Uh, absolutely fantastic work, and we love educating people about these types of efforts and ways they might be able to support these causes. Uh, but on, beh on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy again, signing off from SALT Talks. We hope to see you back here again soon.